what I'm going to do is do a quick sort of lightning um, shoot through various um, milestones in UK education. And then I've got some um, little bits about um, Merton schools, some of them more historic Merton schools. And then I thought I've got a range of pictures that we could sort of talk around um, and um, hopefully share some of your school school reminiscences of sort of school days and life at school and education. Does that sound OK? Yeah. Yes. Right. OK, good stuff. Um, so early education in this country was based on oral tradition and learning by example of, of parents knee. Um, and in Anglo-Saxon England, Christian missionaries created the first schools and these were linked to cathedral churches, um, teaching Latin and scripture to newly converted Saxon lords. Um, and this system evolved um, eventually into the medieval grammar school system. Um, and the first one of these is likely to have been at Canterbury, where um, Augustine of Hippo converted to King Ethelbert, who was one of the sort of Saxon um, kings. Um, and this was schools training people, particularly for sort of public speaking and sermons. There were also some convent schools for girls aiming to be nuns, and those tend to be particularly linked to, to very sort of strong abbesses um, in our country's history. During the medieval period, knights sent their sons to learn at neighbouring courts, where in addition to studying the arts of war and chivalry, they obtained some basic education. Second sons usually entered the church, and by the late Med Middle Ages, monks were acting as um, teachers and educational authorities at monastic and cathedral schools. A little bit more you'll hear about that later, because obviously Merton Priory is an example of that. There were also guild schools for the younger sons of impoverished lords, squires and merchants, um, and those operated on what we now know as the prefect system, where older children reported on the sort of academic progress of their peers. Uh, and this was really a case of, of sort of solely focusing on study, no sort of games or, or separate um, entertainment. Um, Eton School was founded by Henry VI in 1444, and that initially took boys from all over the country. And that's the origin of the term public school because they were taking um, students from a wide catchment area. Girls continued to be taught at home where their focus was on their role as wife and homemaker. Uh, we would probably balk slightly at the description of, of how they, their teaching was meant to be focused, focused on them being submissive, church going, modest, controlling the household and disciplining their servants. <laughs> there were new developments in the Renaissance and, and the Reformation, including the Paxton's printing press, which obviously had an impact on the late 15th century education. And at this stage, guild schools started teaching Greek as well as Latin and some sciences. The dissolution of the monasteries led to the loss of monastic and chantry schools in this country. And by the mid 16th century, there was the development of some lay schools um, with funding from private benefactors, town and parish officials. By the late Tudor and Stuart era, era, we saw the rise of the grammar schools, and these were often founded by laymen with money going to the schools rather than the church, which would have been the traditional source of education. The average Tudor school was very small. Uh, one, sing one single schoolmaster, as you can see in this picture, might teach from five to 75 pupils. Um, and these were the sons of merchants, farmers and parsons. Um, and they ranged from seven to 15 years of age. Um, the, the older children then might leave for university, a career in the church or to study law. And Tudor education was said to be very heavy and tedious learning with a particular focus on grammar. Even in the 17th century, there still wasn't a particular focus on science. In the 18th century, we saw the development of elementary schools to teach literacy. I found this rather nice um, quote um, from the time, which says, every man strains his fortune to keep his children at school. The cobbler will clout till midnight. The porter will carry his burdens till his bones crack again. The plowman will pinch both back and belly to give his son learning. And there was a focus on Bible reading and books of farming husbandry. And by this stage, youngsters who were actually undergoing apprenticeships were fed and clothed by their masters and disciplined, but they were also um, given some instruction in reading and, and lessons of trade. The Industrial Re Revolution, um, or by the Industrial Revolution, I should say, the state was still not really concerned with education for the ma masses, and most of this provision rested with charities and individuals. Sorry, I missed that slide there. That's to give you an idea. That little picture there shows a horn book, which is actually what um, 
Tudor school children need to learn the Lord's Prayer and the alphabet. Um, so during the 18th century, there were also dame schools for the poor. This was often, these were often um, housed in one room and there was little focus on academic achievement. They were quite often run as by the sort of term suggests by a, a sort of single, often elderly lady. Um, and there was a quote from one of these where she said, one of these teachers said, if I can just keep them quiet, it's much as I can do and all I'm paid for. So not a real focus on academia. Um, by the 1780s, um, a Gloucester printer and devout Anglican, Robert Rakes, founded the Sunday school movement to keep working class children off the streets on a Sunday, um, teaching them reading and religion. Um, you also had industrialists in factories and mines who by this stage were meant to be allowing some daily educational provision as part of the working day, but that didn't really amount to practice. Um, by, 1880, by 1833, the Factory Act mandated two hours of education per day, per day for those children working in those um, industrial settings. The early 19th century saw the rise of something called the monitorial voluntary schools. These were often led by chaplains and non-conformist religions like sort of Quakers, um, for example. And here you had a teacher who would instruct the older children in one large classroom. And then those younger children that he had instructed would, would sort of cascade the learning onto the younger pupils. In 1810, the British and Foreign Society was formed to organise monitorial schools, and then you had the national school system, which was created by the Anglican National Society for promoting the education of the poor in the principles of the established church, so very much Church of England teaching. 3,000 national schools were founded in the first 20 years of that movement, um, and another 1,500 by the British and Foreign Society. This was very regimented learning, so it would be literally lessons copied from a board, uh, with young monitors cascading teaching to, to their sort of fellow pupils. Um, and, that, and some of those um, young monitors would only be eight to nine years of age themselves. So you can imagine educational standards weren't necessarily very high. In the 1870 Education Act established school boards to decide on religious instruction and the provision of primary education for all. Schools at this stage were still fee paying, but poor students could apply for a free ticket. And school attendance became compulsory for all under the 1880 Education Act, and elementary education became free for all in 1891. And this led to a lot of rapid school construction, especially in towns in the late Victorian period, and that's actually echoed in, in Merton. There's still less secondary school provision apart from public schools and grammars. Um, in fact, you actually had a ridiculous situation at that stage where there were some schools which had no pupils at all, but head teachers were still drawing a salary. Um, apparently, the Whitgift School in Croydon was one of those um, examples. In 1866, it had not had certain new pupils for 30 years, but the curriculum was still mainly Latin grammar, as in the 16th century. So that may have been a reason for putting people off. We then started to have the creation of schools for the sons of the um, new upper and middle class. So organisations or institutions like Cheltenham, Marlborough and Wellington College were, were opened um, for, for the sons of um, businessmen and, and sort of lesser gentry who wanted a, a education as good as the standard given to, to the members of the nobility. Um, but they focused on subjects aimed at a career. And these were schools which were set up by shareholders with governors to maintain standards. The educational reformer Thomas Arnold, who you can see here, opposed the brutality of, of previous regimes. Many schools had very sort of harsh discipline traditionally. Um, and he gave this quote about his attitude to students. He said, if only he'll turn out a brave, helpful, truth-telling Englishman and a Christian, that's all I want. And the emphasis on schools from his perspective was on character building. Um, but the schools were very much focused still on providing um, or guiding students, male students, I should say, towards a church and a career in the church, the army or the civil service. By 1864, you had a particular educational commission which led to improvements in school standards and the teaching of science. And a lot of that was actually inspired by the 1851 Great Exhibition. There was also more of an attack on class privilege. Um, and at this stage, the school curriculum consisted of the three R's, geography, history, science, European languages, schools, politics, music and drawing. And there was an increasing availability of scholarships. The 19th century saw greater demand for girls schools and campaigning for education, especially for middle class girls. Poor girls at this stage had very little education or if they did, they often went to the same elementary school as their brothers, but with little option for, for sort of higher education. 
thanks to the campaigning of authors Mrs Sanford and Catherine Sinclair, um, you had the founding of the North London Collegiate School in 1850 and Shelton Ladies College in 1853 run by Dorothea Beale, who you can see in that picture. Um, North London was a day school run by Francis Buss, um, charging two guineas per quarter, but that allowed for religious difference and equality in education. And at this time, you also had a lady called Emily Davies, who was campaigning for women's university entrance. Um, and in 1863, the Cambridge examinations were open to women, and that led another educational commission to consider more secondary education for girls and extra funding for girls' schools. So by 1890, there were 34 girls' public day schools. Um, with a whole range of boarding schools and co-educational facilities opened by the 1920s. So, for example, in 1897, there were 20,000 girls in secondary education, and by 1936, there were 500,000, so you can see there's a lot of, lot of development there. In the 20th century, education was still class divided, but there was a great emphasis on the importance of education for contributing to a thriving economy, and the 1902 Education Act organised local educational authorities to replace school boards for the provision of secondary education um, and council rates were now used towards funding schools. You also had a range of welfare improvements so for example in 1906 school meals were introduced um, and school medicals in 1907 and by 1918 the school leaving age had risen to 14. The interwar years also saw the introduction of the 11 plus, creating a break between primary and secondary education. And there was also a widening curriculum um, and grammar schools had started to stream pupils by ability. 1944 Education Act, um, Rab Butler created specific primary and secondary education with a leaving age of 15. And local education authorities were now responsible for providing schools in their own area. And the 11 plus was used to divide school children at secondary level according to ability and aptitude. So the more academic um, that passed the 11 plus went to grammar schools um, and those that um, had failed the 11 plus were sent to secondary modern schools or junior techs for more practical vocational training. And there's often been a, a bit of a, a sort of um, secondary schools being, or secondary modern schools being seen as second best. Um, people felt that, some people felt that they, they were sort of not as, as high a standard, but actually they were very successful in terms of, um, you know, training um, youngsters for, for a career. The 1940s saw the creation of the first comprehensive schools in Middlesex, Coventry, Oldham and parts of Yorkshire. Um, and these were often converted from local grammar schools. And this um, initiative was taken countrywide in 1965 when the Labour government asked local educational authorities to submit plans to develop comprehensives in their area. And two thirds of those had been done by 1969. And it was at that stage that the school leaving age rose to 16. And by 1971, um, 43 out of 163 local education area had um, comprehensive schools and 30% of secondary schools were teaching on comprehensive lines. Um, and there was much more of a focus on um, the, the sort of best way to meet the needs of the individual child. Um, you, you were moving away from plus and there was a much wider subject range, which was and the teaching was felt to be less divisive on class and social status grounds. In the 1960s and 70s, you had the introduction of three-tier education systems, so primary schools for ages five to nine, middle schools for nine to 13 year olds, and high schools and colleges of further education for students aged 13 to 16 or 13 to 18. Um, GCSEs were introduced in 1986 to replace O-levels. And then you have a major development in 1988 with the introduction of the national curriculum to cover st the study of five to 16 year olds split into key stages to define the learning and teaching requirements for different age groups and children now to be continuously assessed by their teachers with stats or key stage tests intended to provide a measure of a child's performance against national standards. And one of the most recent um, initiatives in British education has obviously been the launch of um, academies, which was actually an, an initiative um, led by um, Labour Education Advisor Lord Adonis in 2000. Um, and by January 2019, nearly 3.8 million pupils were attending academies. Um, so you have some local examples there, Harris Academy, Morden. It guess that was originally Garth High School in Morden. Um, at various points, that's had a very sort of a, bit of a sort of um, varied 
level, but Harris Academy now actually enjoys world status. It's the most improved school. Yeah. Um, you also have yeah. Academy Merton there. Um, and also linked to the Academy's um, initiative, you have the different free schools, um, which are actually sort of um, effectively new state schools that operate in law as academies. The first of those was opened in uh, 2011. And these are uh, state funded, not profit and they cover all ability primary or secondary schools and one of the sort of local examples is not that far from where I'm sitting actually is London Acorn Free School which is um, based in Morden Hall Park. So to move to some schooling in Merton, um, the first school in Merton, the first major educational source in Merton would have been Merton Priory um, covering a large area of um, Collier's Wood and parts of South Wimbledon um, and that's where the sons of noblemen or, or sort of ambitious ambitious courses came to be educated um, and these included Thomas Beckett um, in the 1130s and 90s later Archbishop of Canterbury Walter de Merton in 1264 who was um, the founder of Merton College Oxford and Nicholas Breakspear who was actually the only English Pope the earliest purpose-built school um, in Merton was on Central Road in Morden, um, or one of the earliest purpose-built schools. This was the Elizabeth Gardner School. Um, she was the daughter of George Garth, who was the, the Lord of the Manor of Morden. And when she died in 1719, she left £300 for free schooling, according to Church of England principles for the poor of the parish. And a little piece of land near the junction of Central Road and London Road was leased, um, and the school opened in 1731. Um, that was extended over a number of years um, and ultimately had room for 190 children, all studying in one central room. Um, and that building still survives on the, the sort of um, end of, of Central Road. A lot of it's now actually used, if you see a picture from the side, as the, the parish hall. Uh, this is another um, modern um, establishment. We talked about um, in the 18th century, you had a lot of um, sons of noblemen or sort of leading principal businessmen wanting their sons to be privately educated um, and this was one of the sort of establishments that did that this was Morden Hall Academy um, set in the grand surroundings um, of Morden Hall Park um, and this was founded by Reverend John White in 1830 to educate young gentlemen um, and he was assisted by his son Thomas and three assistants and they taught 60 pupils aged from 8 to 17 years um, by 1850, the pupil intake had risen to 73, and there were a number of additional staff. And they um, even most pupils were from the home counties, but there were even some foreign students, apparently. Um, and they learned grammar, arithmetic, French. They were exposed to um, good food and country air. And in addition to their formal lessons, as you can see from this picture, they had outdoor pursuits, including cricket. Um, I'll show you a picture just here. This is, I've showed you the Elizabeth Gardner School. When the local population had grown um, to, to sort of exceed the, the sort of space available at that particular building, Morden County School was, was opened um, here. This is at the top of um, London Road, not that far from St. Lawrence's Church, actually. This was built in 1910 um, with room for 300 children. And the first head teacher was Joseph Rewcastle who was also clerk and overseer to the parish council, was apparently known for being particularly strict. Um, in Merton, um, the, in the um, 17th century, um, a local resident, William Rutledge, who was actually court embroiderer to Charles II, uh, was a, a local landowner in, in a, had a various sort of land um, in the area of what used to be um, the White Hart Inn, now sadly closed that particular sort of pub, but in, in that sort of area. Um, and, and in terms of his will, he actually left a sum of money, um, £400 in fact, from, from the you know, various properties to pay for apprenticeships for poor boys and girls. And that was actually set into a trust fund, um, which matured and grew over the years. And in 1895, Rutledge Science was School was opened using that request um, that was opened largely at the sort of um, or under the auspices of city developer John Innes who was a, a particular exponent for, for improving the life of people and for, for teaching um, and this shows you some illustrations of the original school was which is near Station Road um, in Merton Park that um, remained at that site until um, the Second World War, when part of that building was damaged by bombing, and it was then moved into the in the 1950s to its current site. 
show you some um, Mitcham schools now. Um, I've mentioned about the, the sort of starting of, of sort of the Sunday school movement and the building that you can see at the top was originally a wooden structure, which was the, the local Sunday school in Mitcham. This is on Lower Green West. Um, and by 1812, 1813, this had actually become a, a national school. Um, and for a few pence a week, local youngsters received the basic schooling under the Thomas Compton. That's the bearded gentleman that you can see in the picture underneath. And classes were of mixed age. Um, so younger children copied the lessons onto slates using chalk before graduating to the use of ink pens. And in addition to the teacher, they were supervised by older pupils acting as prefects. Um, if you look in that picture, you've got some of the traditions of Victorian education, including the cat in the corner in a dunce's cap, obviously for some sort of uh, misbehaviour. Um, this actually um, continued um, in use until the 1890s, this building, by which stage conditions had, had become quite poor. It was quite sort of damp, dark and, and quite sort of um, overcrowded. And it was at that stage that they opened um, Lower Mitcham Board Schools, which you might be familiar with now as Benedict Primary School, further down on London Road. Um, and that, in fact, is a picture of Lower Mitcham Board School. Um, so this would have been one of these sort of typical playgrounds which was divided, so you have an entrance for boys and entrance for girls, there would have been also a sort of section for, for mixed infants, but as the children got older, their, their teaching was separated on gender, gender lines. Um, and this here is Mitcham County School for Girls, this is one of a number of um, schools which was opened in the 1930s, which was a particularly sort of burgeoning period for Mitcham um, both. And you can see some of the children there, some of the students surrounded by their head teacher, Miss Pembroke. Um, in the sort of Rains Park area, the sort of earlier schools, this is Aston Road School, which is not a million miles away from where Rains Park Library now stands. Um, and this was a, a very sort of um, small, what looked like a sort of temporary establishment. One of these sort of, um, they often called them tin tabs, it tended to be made from, from sort of um, corrugated metal sheets and so forth, fairly, fairly sort of um, small. Um, this was um, one of the sort of first local schools in that area. You can see some nice pictures of Nelson on the, the back wall of that classroom there. There was very much a sort of focus of teaching as a local hero, having been um, one of the sort of residents of, of Merton during the um, early 19th century. Um, and from 1909, um, Merton, Merton Urban District Council also built new schools in Botsford Road. Um, the picture of the buildings that you show here show what later became known as Rains Park Schools and that the, the buildings were actually later um, known as Joseph Hood First School um, and also um, Merton, the original Merton Adult College on Watley Avenue. Um, in the 1930s, we've talked to you about the, the sort of establishment of a number of schools like Mitcham County School for Girls. This is Rains Park County Grammar School for Boys. Um, which opened in um, 1935 on West Barnes Lane. Um, and this was um, the particular driving force behind that was um, English master head teacher John Garrett, who was part of the sort of Oxford set. He was um, very associated with a number of contemporary sort of artists, writers, actors. Um, and it's for this reason that he persuaded his friend W.H. Auden to, to write the school song. And in fact, a number of leading artists um, and, and sort of leading literary figures actually worked part time as teachers at that particular school. The school badge that you can see there is, is um, apparently meant to symbolise um, the Kingston Bypass, which had opened um, not far from the school in 1927, the, the sort of rail route, which is the circular bit. Um, I'm not 100% sure what the, the sort of lightning flash is like. Maybe that's associated with sort of um, power electricity generation in the area. I'll have to double check on that for you. Um, but that was a very, very successful school. Um, it prided itself on, on academic achievement and there also a whole range of sort of cultural activities that were um, actually set up involving. I mean, they, the boys even had visits from act actors and actresses like same Sybil Thorndike came to talk to them on one particular occasion, for example. Um, it was fee paying, but there were scholarships um, for, for sort of um, students from more humble backgrounds. Um, and in 1982, that um, school was actually converted into a comprehensive county day school for 13 to 18 year olds. Um, and this moved to tell you about some of the sort of modern schools. When the St. Helier estate was constructed in the late 20s and early 1930s, 
uh, many new schools were open to meet the demands of the new population, many of whom had sort of um, transferred from, from inner city London, from some of the slum areas there, but so, so the better housing would have been constructed on the St Helier estate. There were 10 sites allocated for local schools with the first opening in 1930 and initially the schools as the area was still being developed um, initially they were given numbers rather than names so number one school that you can see here um, was later known as the willows um, on central road that opened in 1930 and held a central girls junior mixed school and infants section uh, number two was canterbury road school um, that opened in 1930-31 for boys and junior mixed infants. Um, you had number three school, which was Garth. Um, that's now the, the Harris Academy that I showed you in an earlier picture. Number four was Malmesbury School, um, which was opened in 1932 for girls and junior mixed infants. Um, number five was Abbotsbury and number six was Glastonbury, which is um, now known as the Chaucer Centre. It um, uh, has traditionally been a sort of teacher training centre in, in recent years in Merton. You also had Poplar School, which, which opened in 1932. Um, and it's a testament to school discipline at the time that when that school opened, a class of 42 children needed just one teacher. So a whole range of local schools opening in Morden in the, the sort of interwar years as the St Helier estate developed. Um, now I've got some pictures just to tell you about some of the historic schools in the Wimbledon area. The, um, the one that you can see at the top there is the Central School um, on Camp Road in Wimbledon. Um, and that was, um, sorry, I'm just grappling to find my piece of paper. Um, that was actually... Um, opened in around about 1760. Um, by 1810, you can see the sort of, it looked as the illustration that you can see on the top just there. Um, and that was actually, sorry, I correct my date. That was founded in 1758 as the principal elementary school in Wimbledon Village. It was initially known as the Round School. You can imagine that given the sort of you know, octagonal shape of the building. And it was run as a charity school for poor, poor children. Um, and amongst its trustees was local resident William Wilberforce, um, famous as a, a later as an anti-slavery campaigner. Um, and that school was actually um, associated with the foundation of Wimbledon Football Club as well, because that was actually started in 1889 by um, a group of former pupils of that particular school. And it sort of remained in use for, for many years as an educational facility, um, later known as Wil Wilberforce House School, um, which focused on teaching for special needs children. This is another um, famous school from the Wimbledon area. This is King's College School um, that was originally founded on the Strand um, by a charter from George IV in 1829 um, to teach the sons of city gentlemen and um, upper middle class students. Um, its teaching staff included Dante Gabriel Rossetti, the artist, if any of you have been watching any of the sort of um, pre-Raphaelite series that are on TV at the moment. Um, by 1897, um, falling pupil numbers at its strand site prompted the school to move to what's now its current site off Southside in Wimbledon, which was by then a fast growing suburb well served by the, the railway lines from Surrey and South London. And a separate junior school was opened on the same campus in 1912. And you can see the beautiful Gothic grey Great hall that it has there that's used for a lot of award ceremonies and, and um, assemblies and so forth and what King's College School as with Rutledge School in Merton Park actually had a, a um, military cadet force and some of the pupils that you can see some of the boarders in that picture at that lower in that lower picture uh, would sadly have gone on to, to become members of the officer corps um, that were recruited for or volunteered I should in many instances for, for service during the First World War. So sadly, a lot of those boys that were educated together were also to die together on the fields of the Western Front and, and other sort of First World War conflict zones. This picture here is Queen's Road School. This is one of a number of schools that opened in Wimbledon in the um, late Victorian and early 19th period and early 1900s. This one was about 1902, I think I'm right in saying. This now actually survives as Priory Church of England, um, Priory Church of England Primary School. Um, and the building actually looks much the same. At this stage um, in its early sort of history, it would have had one floor um, housing mixed infants, another floor for, for um, a boys' school and another floor for, for separate teaching for girls. 
And I'll finish off just showing you this picture. This is a rather grand building now, better known as, as luxury flats. This was Pelham Road School, um, which was um, opened in 1896 for around 300 children. This isn't, is it, I think this is actually the, the sort of um, slightly later school building. The original one was a, a little further down the road. Uh, but it survived two world wars as a sort of school institution um, and then opened a new building in 1955 um, and has celebrated a range of different sort of anniversaries it's it was a very sort of popular school we get a lot of inquiries from from former students at this particular establishment All right so that's my um range of, of pictures of of um, giving you a sort of oversight of um various developments in English education and the history of some of our Merton schools 